We continue with the jury trial, voir dire, day three. The court. I will also let you know, and I don't know that this appears on paper either, but the next juror, William Moore, his spouse, Alice Moore, is a recently retired employee of the clerk, clerk of court's office who is during the pendency of this trial back working at the clerk of court's office to help fill in for staff shortage down there during the trial. That may speed things along for your questioning, and but I did want to make the jurors, the parties, aware of that fact. Attorney Fallon, could we have a moment just to the court? Go ahead. Attorney Fallon, contemplate the meaning of all that? The court, yes. Attorney Fallon, we'll proceed. The court, then we'll bring William Moore out as the next juror. Mr. Moore, please raise your right hand and the clerk will administer the oath. Juror sworn. The clerk, please be seated. Voir dire examination by Attorney Fallon. Good afternoon, Mr. Moore. Yes. My name is Tom Fallon and I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Wisconsin Department of Justice. I'm one of the prosecutors in this case. To my immediate left is Mr. Ken Kratz. He's a Calumet County District Attorney and Special Prosecutor as well. Thank you for coming in this afternoon. The point of the afternoon session here is to follow up on some of the information that you provided in your questionnaire last Monday. And that's where we'll begin. Seems to me you have a few relationships with which are of interest to the parties here. And the court has just advised us we're under the impression that your wife's an employee of the clerk of court's office? Yes, a temporary employee. All right, uh, and temporary at the current time as I understand? Yes. All right, and she previously worked at the clerk of court's office? Yes. All right, has she officially retired and is just coming back to help out? Correct. All right. Could you tell us when she retired? Um, June of 05, I believe. June of 05, all right. Yes. Okay, and how long did she work in the office, do you recall? 13 and 14 years. All right. Had she had other county employment before she was in the clerk's office? No. All right, and her current duties in the clerk's office, if you know, are what? Just the clerk of court. All right, very good. And you said temporary. Is it for a period of time longer than the expected length of this trial, or is it? No, just about the six week period. Just to help out for the overload as a result of the trial? Right. Okay, more to the point. How well do you know any of your wife's co-workers? That was one of the questions I wanted to ask about. All right. I believe the question stated, do you personally know? And then they went quite a lengthy list of names. Right. And that the word personally was, the more I thought about it after I filled this out, I wondered what they meant by personally. Okay. I've been to parties with one or two individuals on that list like a graduation party, a Christmas party, things of that nature. All right, well, let's, let's change the adjective from personally or the, and go to, of the individuals in the office, say. For instance, do you know the woman here, Janet Bonin? Yes. All right, would you say that you're a friend, a close friend, close acquaintance, casual acquaintance? How would you describe your knowledge of her? Casual acquaintance, okay. By that I mean once a year maybe I see her. All right, out. In a setting other than the courthouse? Right. All right, who else in the office would you say is in that category, casual acquaintance? Somebody that you would know. Probably Mary Jo Murray. Mary Jo Murray? Murray, okay. And under the same casual acquaintance? And under the same casual acquaintance. Sure, all right. Do you know the clerk of court, Lynn Zygmunt? About the same. Okay. Acquaintance. 
anyone else that you think that you can think of that you have at least some kind of casual relationship with? Probably Brenda. She's been Brenda Smith. All right. Actually, several of them. I mean, they have all been to the same Christmas party. Right. Or birthday or graduation party. Parties, right? So, Nicole, I don't remember a lot of the other names. All right. Are any of them, would you consider any of them close friends? You know, somebody that you see more often, more socially, than these traditional Christmas gatherings or special occasion events? Brenda, we had a, what you call a AA meetings, alcohol. Right, sure. We used to gather, but we don't even do that anymore. All right. That was like a once a month thing and we just did that, sure, over the winter. Okay. And we haven't done that this winter. All right. So, okay, well, the reason we ask is there's a possibility that some of those individuals may show up as witness in this case. It's still yet to be determined if that occurs. And so the question is, since your wife has worked in that office for a number of years and is now temporarily filling in, if that were to occur, would you have a problem? Would you be uncomfortable as a juror trying to assess the credibility of these witnesses? No. All right. You feel that you could evaluate their testimony the same as you would any other witness that might appear in this case? Yes. All right. You feel pretty confident about that? Yes. Even though your wife is now back working in the office as a temporary clerk, and should you be selected as a juror in this case, do you have any worries or concerns about the effect or any feedback you would get from a verdict you reach, whether it's a guilty verdict or a not guilty verdict? Do you think that might cause some problems at home or any other issues for you and your wife? No, certainly not. All right, okay. Now, there was one other relationship that I wanted to clarify. In answer to the question, do you know or are you acquainted with any member of Stephen Avery's family or any of his relatives? You answered yes. I think you said your wife's brother's wife is a cousin. Would that be your sister-in-law is a cousin of Mr. Avery? My wife's sister-in-law. Your wife's sister through marriage this is. Okay, and it would be a distant cousin, like a third or possibly a fourth. Okay, cousin. Are you sure that it's a third or fourth degree cousin? Yeah. Okay, not anything closer than that? No. Do you have occasion at all to see the sister-in-law at all? Once a year, maybe. All right. Christmas time. All right, possibly. Have you had any contact with her or any member of her family since this case has grabbed the headlines, as it were? No. All right. The fact that you have this relationship, does that make it uncomfortable for you to be a juror in this case and to have to render a ver verdict of either guilty or not guilty based on the evidence? No. All right. You feel pretty confident that you would be able to decide this case solely on the evidence that's presented in the trial and without deference to any association through the, your, through marriage or through your wife's work? Yeah, that wouldn't have any impact on it. All right, and you are pretty confident of that? Yes. All right, okay. There's been a, as you are probably aware, a fair amount of publicity about this case, so I wanna start with that. And there's several questions of interest to both parties relative to the publicity. Now, when you were asked a question in your questionnaire, you indicated you haven't formed any opinions based on the publicity. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And you say you have discussed this case at length with any other, you have, and you say, have you discussed this case at length with any other persons? You answered yes. And in your explanation, you said you have maintained that Mr. Avery could be innocent. Is that correct? Yes. With whom would you have had that discussion? Oh, my brothers and sisters, and also on my wife's side, her brothers and sisters. Okay, all right. 
So you have had some family discussions regarding this particular case? Yes. All right. In terms of that discussion, during the course of it, was any of the expected or anticipated evidence in this case part of the discussion, the arguments, or the give and take? What do you mean by expected? Well, for instance, when you discuss the case with your brothers and sisters and your wife's brothers and sisters, I would imagine, you know, there would be some, well, I think he's guilty because of X, Y, and Z. Somebody else would say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that because of A, B, and C. I mean, is that the kind of thing, just kind of discussion that you're having? Mm-hmm. All right. So my question then to you, sir, is what information do you have or that was presented to you during the course of these discussions? What kind of information did the media provide you that was fueling the discussion, as it were? That the evidence was found at the salvage yard, the body, and it was in the burn barrel. There was keys found in the trailer that belonged to the car, her car. Right. Any discussion regarding a fellow by the name of Brendan Dassey and what he may or may not have said as part of the family discussion? Yes, his name was brought up, and it was just kind of, yes, he could have been there. No, he couldn't have been there. Just nothing definite, nothing definitive. It was just, all right. Was there any discussion from any of the family members regarding the details of what Mr. Dassey is reported to have described happening? If I remember right, just something said about he was physically there at the time it happened. All right. Do you recall any other details that are attributed to Mr. Dassey's description of the events? None. All right. In terms of the coverage of this case, did you recently receive a letter from Judge Willis asking you to refrain from reading and watching the news relative to this case? Yes. All right. And have you been able to abide by that? Yes. What's the last thing you remember seeing or in the news or hearing about in the news regarding this case before you stopped paying attention altogether? Just that the trial was going to take place this week? All right. As soon as they had the jurors picked. All right, so you haven't paid attention to any of the recent news articles or any of the issues that the lawyers have been arguing in court about or any of that? No. All right, and you're not familiar with any discussion of any blood or blood evidence or anything like that? There was some bile or blood bile found. Okay, what do you recall or remember about that? It was supposedly tampered with. All right. It was unsecured or in an unsecured area. All right. And do you have any recollection as to where that area would be or any other details about that? I believe it was in the clerk of court office. Okay. All right. And the fact that there's the possibility of some evidence that's associated with the police where your wife works, is that going to present any problems for you? No. All right. No, I believe that happened while she was not employed there. All right. And what what do you believe happened while she was not employed there? I I don't know. Okay. It was just curious as to your choice of words when you said why you chose that choice of words in terms of whatever happened or you believed it happened when she wasn't employed there. So I'm thinking that you must have something in your head that something must have happened. Well, they said that blood had been tempered with. Okay, and I'm saying that must have happened sometime prior to her going back there as a temporary. Okay, that's all. Now, why do you say that? I believe that evidence came out about, it was before she started there as a temporary. That evidence must be a couple weeks old for sure. All right. And she just started working there this last Monday. All right, well, if it came to pass that the evidence was in the possession of the clerk's office for 10 years, would that change your opinion and make it perhaps difficult for you to sit on this case? No, it would not. It would not make it. All right, and why wouldn't it? She didn't have accessibility to the sample. Okay, so I feel it didn't affect her. All right, and how would you know that? 
She told me that. All right, Attorney Fallon. Could I have a moment, Your Honor? By att Attorney Fallon. Just a couple more questions. So I take it there's been at least some discussion in your family with your wife about this blood vial? That was the only discussion, all right, that she did not have accessibility to the sample. Okay, any other discussion as to who may have had access to the blood vial? I don't believe so. Are you reasonably sure or just nothing that comes to your mind right now? Nothing comes to my mind. No. All right. Now, you indicated that, that in the discussions with the family members, you maintain that it's possible that Mr. Avery could be innocent. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And what was your thinking or how did that come to pass? Well, I believe every person is innocent until proven guilty. And I'll look at the evidence presented and come up with the, hopefully, a fair and just judgment on this. Okay. You feel pretty confident in your ability to do that? Yes. Okay. Also, I know from your questionnaire that it looks like you had an encounter with an individual who is not all that pleasant and was attempting to fight with you. Is that correct? That's correct. And you made a complaint to the police department? Well, we were both taken into custody that evening. All right. And I never saw this person before in my life. And in fact, I tried avoiding him. And when I turned my back on him, he jumped me. And that's when the police showed up. It was right at the intersection of Washington and 8th Street. So it was a pretty prominent intersection in town. Sure. And good thing they came along when they did because they pulled him off of me. And they kept asking him what I had done to make him want to fight with me. <clears throat> and they asked, they asked him that three times, and I wondered, does, is there a relationship there? Why would they put it that way? Mm-hmm. And they asked me, do you know this person? And why do you want to fight with him? And I says, I told you already, I don't want to fight with him. I refuse to fight. And when I turned my back, that's when he jumped me. Mm-hmm. And that's when you people showed up. Okay, so it was just happenstance that they showed up right at that moment? Right. Okay. Did you know the guy? No. Never saw him in my life. Never saw him before? Nope. All right. So it was a mystery to everyone as to why he decided to pick a fight with you? Yes. Okay. And apparently there was no follow-up report filed or no charges filed or any of that sort? No. The police said they would after they released us the next morning. Right. They said that they would call to find out or to let us know if they're going to press charges or not, and they never called. All right, now, was that, did that other guy had, can you think of any reason? I mean, did he have too much to drink? I mean, did he mistake you for somebody else? Did, any idea? I think he maybe thought my car should have been going faster than what it was because he was right on my bumper. I see. I had a 68 Camaro Rally Sport. It was a nice looking vehicle. All right. And he stayed right on my bumper. And it was foolish of me to pull into the Pizza Garden parking lot. I should have went right to the police station. I see. So he was a traffic vigilante, as we say. All right. Yeah, I couldn't shake him. I tried a couple going from north of town to the Pizza Garden, which was right downtown. I tried a couple of side streets and I couldn't shake him. I thought I was in his way, you know? All right, but he just kept right out on me. Okay, well, how did you feel about the fact that the police didn't ask the DA to press charges? I felt at the time that they didn't do their job, but thinking back on it, I thought, well, it was his word against my word and they just came upon two people fighting, so I suppose I could see their side of it too. All right, in res retrospect, do you think it was handled fairly or unfairly? I would have to say fairly. All right, just going by their evidence and what, what I told them. All right, so with the passage of time, you've had the ability to reflect on it and have a somewhat, I suspect, 
different perspective than you had that night when it happened? Right. Okay. All right. Well, the reason that's of some importance to all of us here is that there's going to be a fair amount of testimony from law enforcement officers of all sizes and shapes and departments and what have you, police and sheriff and the like. One of the things as a jury you'll be asked to do is to evaluate the credibility of witnesses. And the court will be instructing you that you should evaluate the credibility, the honesty, the believability of all of the witnesses the same. In other words, just because they're a police officer or an expert witness or even a defendant for that matter, you should evaluate their testimony the same as you would anyone else. Think you could follow that instruction? Yes, I do. <clears throat> All right. Is there any doubt in your mind based on this, you know, encounter with this crazy guy that, you know, although you might have wanted to see charges pressed years ago, is there any way that would affect your ability to evaluate the testimony of the officers the same as you would any other witness? No, that wouldn't affect it. All right. Now, apparently you've also had, I take it, some good experiences with the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department. You mentioned some work they do with the fire department? Yes. Have you an association with the fire department at all? No, I'm a volunteer fireman. Oh, you're a volunteer. That was what I was getting at. Yes. All right, so tell me about your encounters working with the sheriff's department as a volunteer fireman. On certain accident scenes out in the country, we would need traffic control. And at times, they would block intersections or block up parts of the road, whatever we needed, when they had personnel available to do that. But now, most of the time, it's just the fire departments themselves that are doing the traffic control. I see. So when you, so did you have any direct contact with members of the sheriff's department for traffic control or firefighting duties as a volunteer? I would have to say no. Okay, all right. But so your opinion or your impression then comes from just your volunteering and being on the scene. And it, I take it, it generally seemed to you that everything was working smoothly and people were doing what they were supposed to do and getting along. That's correct. Okay. Now, as a volunteer fireman, have you ever participated, for instance, in any missing person searches or anything like that? A number of years ago, there was a search in the town of Two Creeks, where I'm a volunteer in, of a missing person. In the town of, I'm sorry, Two Creeks. Two Creeks, okay. And what kind of role did you have assisting in that? We walked down the road, Highway 42, looking in culverts for a possible body. Okay. In places where a body could be dumped? Sure. Was there any, was the person located at all? No. All right. How long were you involved in the search? Oh, part of an afternoon. I'll say two, three hours. All right. Were you part of a, an overall team or organized plan of searching or were you just more or less on your own? Yes, it was through the fire department. It was most of the department was involved. Okay. Who was coordinating the search, by the way, overall? The sheriff or a local police, or who was helping orchestrate the search? Or was it just some private citizens? I believe it was under the direction of the county traffic department. County traffic department, okay. They're, they are the ones who page us out for any fire calls or anything, so I'm thinking that direction would have come, had to come to them. Okay. Did you find that how did you like that experience of participating in a missing person search, only to find no person? I was glad it turned out that way. All right, and why was that? Almost afraid that you would find somebody deceased? Yeah, and wondered what the, what the condition would be, right, of that body. Now, in terms of the big picture perspective here, was that person ever located to your knowledge? I don't remember. That's quite a number of years ago. Okay. Now, since this case, you might, if selected as a juror, hear evidence that's how this case started. 
the fact that you have participated in one of those searches, does that raise any question in your mind as to whether you would be able to listen to the evidence in this case and decide this strictly on what's presented in this case? That wouldn't bother me. Okay, Attorney Fallon, one moment. Question by Attorney Fallon. I just have a couple last questions. I see you served on a jury once before. Yes. Was that a, a civil case or a criminal case? And the reason I ask you is you checked civil, but you said you found a verdict of guilty. So I'm, what kind of, if you could tell us a little bit about the case. Yeah, I'm confused as far as civil or criminal. It was a drunken driving charge. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Well, that could be either one. All right. So how long did the trial last? It was just one day. All right. And were you asked to make a determination based on reasonable doubt? Or was the burden for the prosecutor clear and convincing evidence? It was beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. How long did the deliberations go? An hour? Two hours? Three? I'm going to say an hour. All right. Were you the four person? No. Okay. Was there anything about the experience of working with your peers, other community members, in evaluating the evidence and debating the pros and cons of each side's arguments? Was there anything about that experience that causes or any question in your mind as to whether you could perform that role again, even in this case, where the stakes are much higher? No, that wouldn't bother me. Attorney Fallon. All right, I will pass the juror for now. The court. Mr. Strang? Attorney Strang. Thank you. Voir dire examination by Attorney Strang. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Mr. Moore. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Dean Strang, and this is Jerome Buting and Stephen Avery. We're the defense lawyers defending Mr. Avery. Let me go to this incident where the fellow jumped on you. Okay. That was... I think you said that was right here. It wound up at the corner of 8th and Washington? Yes. Was it the Manitowoc Police Department who happened on you? Yes. It had happened, it had nothing to do with the Sheriff's Department? Right. And if I, under, if I understood you correctly, you come here today presuming Mr. Avery innocent? Right. And you haven't made any further decision or opinion about the case other than he like anyone charged with the crime, is presumed innocent? Correct. What I, what I need to know is that, then, if you are asked in the end to be one of the people who actually serve on the jury, that you would consider any evidence that we offer just as you would consider any evidence the state offers? Right. That you would be willing to consider both sides? Right. If we offer evidence? Yeah. All right, you understand, first of all, that we don't have a burden of proof? The accused in this country has no burden of proof, no burden to prove himself innocent. Rather, the state or the government has to, the burden to prove him guilty, beyond a reasonable doubt? Correct. And that's a rule you can follow? Yep. However, if we would call witnesses for the defense, maybe, for example, a witness to explain <clears throat> why someone might confess to something he really didn't do. If that became an issue in this case, would you listen to that sort of testimony from the defense, just as you would listen to the state's testimony? <clears throat> yes. If we offered evidence tending to suggest that law enforcement officers had a bias in this case, or reasons to get out of line, cross a line, would you at least listen to that evidence with an open mind? Yes. One of the things that's difficult in any criminal case, both for the man or woman accused of, accused and for the defense lawyers, is to decide whether the accused should testify in his own defense or not testify. Do you understand that in this country, a person accused of a crime has the right to choose to do either, that is, to testify or decline to testify? Yes. Is that a rule that you can live with if the court instructs you on it? Yes. You can follow that? Yes. And if Mr. Avery, with our advice, 
or to decide to take the stand and testify, would you consider his testimony, his testimony just as that of any other witness? Yes. You, of course, don't know, you can't know, whether you would believe him or not believe him, just like you couldn't know whether you would believe or not believe any other witness? That's correct. But you would hear him and consider the same factors in deciding whether to believe him or not? Yes. Same with the police officer. Regardless whether we called the police officer or the state called him? Yes. What if Mr. Avery, again, on our advice, decided not to testify? And you would be able and willing, you know, really to follow and embrace the rule from the court that the defendant's decision not to testify is something you cannot consider as any evidence of guilt and, in fact, cannot consider at all in deciding whether the state has proven him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Can you follow that rule? <clears throat> Could you explain that again? It's got long, I'm sorry. If he, if he decides not to testify, okay, in this trial, he does not take the witness stand. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Could you follow a rule that says you can't even consider it, cannot even consider that fact in weighing the evidence and deciding your verdict? Yes, I could. Can you see, or do you agree, I guess I'll ask you, that the defendant faces the risk, if he does testify, that people will think he's up there going to say anything to try to save his skin? Can you see how that might be a concern if you're a defendant? Yes, but I wouldn't, that thought wouldn't have entered my mind. Okay, your mind, but you can see how it might enter the accused mind? Right. And at the same time, can you see how the accused might say, boy, if I don't testify, will the jurors think I'm hiding something or that I might be guilty? Otherwise, I would get up and say I was innocent. Can you see how he might, he might feel that way? Mm-hmm. Yes, no, yes. Okay, but in the end, you're willing to live by rules that say you can't speculate on those reasons. You are just here to consider the evidence and decide whether the state has proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's correct. Suppose that at the end of all the evidence from either side or both, you were left with the sense that the defendant could be guilty, but that you were not convinced of it beyond a reasonable doubt, and yet you didn't know who did kill this young woman if he didn't. Could you vote not guilty if you just were not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Avery was the one who killed Teresa Hobbock? Yes, I could. And live with the uncertainty about who did it? Yes, Attorney Strang. That's all I have. Thank you very much. The court. Anything else? If not, Mr. Moore, we'll have the clerk escort you from the courtroom at this time, wherein the juror was excused. The court. Counsel, is there a motion from either party? Attorney Fallon. From the state, there will be, Your Honor. I didn't move right away. I wanted to hear Mr. Moore's response to the rest of my questions and to Mr. Strang's as well, and I think and think about this. And I've come to the conclusion that we believe that Mr. Moore should be struck for cause and would so move. My concern is wholly related to the potential that witnesses from the clerk's office will be called to the stand in this case. I'm concerned by the fact that if he were selected as a juror, he would have knowledge about the workings of the office which may extend beyond that which is introduced as evidence. He's already had a discussion with his wife regarding what she knows or does not know of the existence of this vial of blood and whether she had access to it. And based on what the parties know, in terms of the circumstances of the evidence, I'm not sure that he has all the information. Nonetheless, I think that what we have here is an individual that I'm not sure if it's best articulated as an objective bias or a statutory bias, most likely objective bias for his, by his association with potential witnesses. Admittedly, there are casual acquaintances, but then again, his wife worked in that office during much of the time in which that vial of blood was part of a previous proceeding 
and he's had those discussions. And quite frankly, I think the possibility of, of, of information extraneous to what is introduced is too high to take that chance. And we move that he be struck for cause, the court. Mr. Strang, Attorney Strang, thank you, Your Honor. There is not cause to strike Mr. Moore. Let's go back, for starters, to the case that Mr. Fallon cited yesterday arising out of District 1, District 1 Court of Appeals, in which someone who actually was an employee of the District Attorney's Office of Milwaukee County, albeit in the juvenile section, not downtown, herself served as a juror. And the law of Wisconsin was that that was not cause for strike, where she said that, although employed by the same agency that was prosecuting the criminal case, she could be fair in the case. This is at least two steps removed from that situation. One, the Manitowoc County Clerk's Office is not involved in this case, either as a prosecuting party, a defending party, or an investigating party. Second, there is no claim by the defense, certainly no claim by the state, of which I'm aware, of any wrongdoing by anyone in the clerk's office to the extent that some member of the clerk's office may be a witness in the case. It would not be where his or her own conduct is at issue at all. It would be to establish a physical location of a box or a file and what was known about its condition, if anything. So the casual acquaintance with Janet Bonin, for example, who I think we all have agreed we aren't going to call as a witness, so that she can continue to serve as clerk, really would have no bearing at all on any claim, defense, prosecution, theory being offered in the case. And the familiarity with, let's say, Lynn Zygmunt, who conceivably could be a witness, a casual acquaintance, one time a year, maybe at the Christmas party or the graduation party, sounds to me ever so much like Jacqueline Ungroth's acquaintance with Mr. Kratz, the woman who is married to the former Corporation Council of Calumet County and sees Mr. Kratz annually at the bar dinner, the bench bar dinner, whatever it is. Indeed, that sounds like a longer standing annual renewal and more recently sharing the same table over dinner during the pendency of this case. It sounded like a closer connection and that was not cause to strike Mrs. Ungroth. In the court's view, so we're removed from that, I think, considerably here with Mr. Moore. And I can't, I can't think of any other reason, nor have I heard one, that would be offered to strike him for cause. So, the court. Let me help focus the argument. Attorney Strang. Sure. The court. For the parties a bit here. Neither party is arguing, and I agree in terms of subjective bias. It appears this would be a very good juror. He seems to have a concept of what a juror's duty is and be willing to fill it. And in terms of familiarity with members of the clerk's office, I'm not sure that that alone would give the court too much concern, although I don't know what evidence the parties intend to introduce. What bothers me a bit is that because he mentioned in one answer that he spoke to his wife and learned that she would not have had access to the, to the disputed evidence, the blood vial, that in the course of deliberations he may know something about the operation of the clerk's office that wasn't brought in in evidence by virtue of his wife's having worked there. And uh, if some juror asks a question in the course of their deliberations, the difficulty he may have in disclosing, discussing, or taking into consideration just for his own deliberations knowledge about the operations of that office that were not part of the evidence in this case. That I view as a concern. Attorney Strang. And here is why I think it's not a concern. This court was very clear in its written ruling on the admissibility of evidence concerning the vial of blood that the only period of time we're allowed to talk about is November 3, November 4, and November 5, 2005. Now, that cl that's clearly a period of time when his wife was not employed at the clerk's office, either as a full-time person, because she had retired some months earlier, or in the temporary position that apparently she assumed just 
It wasn't clear whether it was Monday, February 5, or Monday, January 29, when he said last Monday, but I took it as one or the other, that she began her temporary employment here in 07. So given the limitation that the court has placed on evidence <clears throat> concerning possible access to the blood vial, he just would not be in a position to know anything from his wife. The court. Well, I understand that, but what about the questions about how difficult it is to get into the office, where those files are typically kept, that type of thing? I mean, she could have some background information that isn't necessarily date-specific that could. And again, I'm operating at a disadvantage here. I don't know what evidence you folks are going to be introducing, but it seems to me that my biggest concern as I evaluate his qualifications as a juror would be information that he may possess that may be difficult to point a finger to now because nobody knows the significance of it. Attorney Strang. Well, that's right. And you know, the record we have, none of that was brought out. But beyond that, you know, we had a young woman yesterday whose boyfriend's aunt is Kelly Tice with the Sheriff's Department. Now, might she know something about the operation of the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department that would cause her to be considering that information in weighing testimony about the operation of that department? Sure, but you know, this is the court. This is a little closer than that, though. He said he's already talked to her about it, his wife, and she said that she didn't have access to it. Attorney Strain. She said that she had no access to it, as I understood him. That's correct. The court. Yeah. Attorney Strang. And I'm not saying it's a perfect match. I'm just saying that we're going to have these connections. And we're going to have to rely on, in the end, on the instruction the court will give the jurors that they are to decide the case only on the evidence before them. I mean, goodness knows. We've been concerned about that. And up to this point, the court hasn't been willing to do anything curative beyond that. So I, and you know, I don't think anyone, anything more would be necessary here. This is someone who, at least I took him to be comfortable following the rules, so to speak, as the court gives them. The court, Mr. Fallon, Attorney Fallon, thank you. Just for the record, the case to which I referred to the other day and to which counsel refers again today is State versus Dale Smith, common spelling. 2006, Wisconsin Opinion Number 74. It's a Supreme Court opinion. I think I do see a difference between the Smith case and the judicial, or excuse me, the administrative assistant who worked for the district attorney's office out in juvenile court, who was then seated as a juror for the, a felony court case downtown. And the distinction is that she had no other connection whatsoever with the case that she sat as a juror on, other than through the ranks. She worked for the same person as the prosecutor downtown. And the prosecutor, in fact, if I recall correctly, did not know this person well, if at all. <clears throat> in the case at hand, we have a possible juror here who knows several people in the office. He has again, as I said, asked questions of his wife regarding this vial of blood which may or may not be introduced and may or may not be a big factor or central focus of the case. Its future remains to be seen. But having said that, the court made the comments that I would make now, and that is, there are other bits of information, and that includes access to the clerk's office who, had, who may or may not have had keys who may or may not have access to the cipher lock to get through the second security door and the like. And there's a variety of possible bits of evidence which could be introduced or for whatever reason are admitted by the parties. And that evidence, it may be admitted by error because we overlooked it, we overlooked it, or there may be an intentional, well, I don't want to ask that question. And the possibility that that juror may know the answer or can find out the answer raises a question relative to the possibility of objective bias existing and or developing 
during the course of the trial. And that's why I think it is different. And if we take the general proviso of the Lendell case, I think the appearance or the prospect of bias occurring is at least real enough to justify an excuse for cause. Thanks. Attorney Strang. Well, although, by my eye on the clock, Mr. Fallon's voir dire went well over the 20 minutes the court had described, the juror is still here. I mean, we can, we can ask these questions. There's just nothing here suggesting that he's got any extra knowledge of the procedures of that office or any way to know what the access was or whatever the procedures were. The court. Okay. Attorney Strang. During the period of time. The court. I think that's a valid suggestion. I will note the defense that time didn't come close to using their 20 minutes, so that's a fair suggestion. Let's bring the juror back in. I will give both parties an opportunity. Attorney Strang, does the court want to start? The court, I will let you start. You may be seated, Mr. Moore. The parties have a few more questions they would like to address to you. I will let Mr. Strang, you may continue. What dear examination by Attorney Strang? Question, lucky you. Was your wife, Alice Moore, employed in any fashion at the clerk of court's office between November 3 and November 5, 2005? Yes. I, I'm sorry, I, I understood you to say she retired in June of 05. Was I wrong about that? Maybe. Janet, can you help me with that, Janet? I thought it was June 2005. The clerk. I know the answer. The court. I'm told the clerk knows the answer. I don't know if the parties want that. I mean, the juror. Attorney Fallon. I don't have any problem with her providing the answer. We're just trying to figure out the parameters of where we are. The court. It's not a question of a witness at a trial, so... Attorney Strang. No, let's get the answer. The clerk. No, she wasn't. Attorney Strang. Okay, all right. Question by the court. Is that good enough for you? Answer. Sure. Question. Okay. Have you ever, in connection with this case, have you ever discussed with your wife the specifics of who had access to what areas of the clerk's office? No. Was the discussion with her more simply that she did not have access to whatever this file was with the vial of blood? Correct. Did she tell you anything at all about whether it was possible or not possible? for someone outside the clerk's office to have obtained access to the vial of blood between November 3 and November 5, 2005? I don't remember if she did or not. If it was, I don't know if it's possible. But in any event, I guess she wasn't working there during those three days. Which three days? November 3 to November 5, 2005. Correct. And if if the court instructs you in the end, if you serve on the jury, the court instructs you to decide this case only on the evidence you hear in the courtroom, not anything you may know or think you know from the media or from your wife or from a neighbor or any other source than outside this courtroom. Can you follow the instructions scrupulously to decide this case only on the evidence you heard in court? Yes including if that evidence were to conflict with something you think your wife might say if you asked her, <clears throat> can you follow the court's rule to decide the case <clears throat> only on the evidence you actually hear in this courtroom? Yes. Any question at all about that? I wouldn't be asking my wife because if I would be on the jury, I would be prohibited to talk to her about it. And would you live with that rule too? Yes. Thank you. The court. Mr. Fallon? Attorney Fallon. Thank you. For dear examination by Attorney Fallon. Mr. Moore, when did you have the discussion with your wife <clears throat> regarding the possibility of her having access or not having access to the vial of blood? When did that occur? I'm not real good on dates here. Within the last month? I would say yes. All right. 
Was there anyone else present other than just the two of you? No. As best you can, can you tell us what was discussed? What did she tell you? Everything that you can recall of that conversation. Just that the vial was in the office and that it was in an unsecure area. Or maybe I picked that up off TV. I'm not sure now. Okay. But that's all I remember. Okay. Did she describe to you how it was not possible for her or how she could not have had access to the vial? No. She just said, Bill, I didn't have access to it. Did you have ask the question or did she volunteer it to you? She volunteered it to me. Okay. Any particular reason how that came up in the conversation? Probably since we heard it on the news. Okay. Do you recall what you heard on the news? Just basically that, that it was a vial of blood, old, old sample of blood. Okay and that it had been tampered with. And I believe the TV showed a security tape or something that you could see was ripped or something off of that sample. And how do you know? Do you know if it's been tampered with or is that just an impression you have? Or where does that come from? Just took the media's word for it. Okay, why would you take the media's word for that? That's the only source, and don't get me wrong, I take everything that the media says with a grain of salt. All right. I don't necessarily believe it or not believe it. All right, so do you have any an opinion right now as to whether that sample was tampered? No. All right, so you were just using that phrase because that's how it was portrayed by the media? Right. All right, so... It's your recollection that your wife just volunteered that information? Yes. Okay, one second. Where did your wife tell you the vial was located, such that she did not have access to it? She just, if I recall the words, it was in a file. That's all she said. In a file? In a file. So you don't know if it was in a secured or unsecured area? No, I don't. And if it's in an unsecure area, she would have access to it? I suppose if she would have known that it was there, maybe she didn't even know it was there. I have no idea. All right, so you're just taking her at her word when she says, I didn't have access to it. Correct, yeah. I don't know the office myself. I don't know the layout, so I wouldn't even know where she, where it's stored. It was a surprise to me to find out that something like that would be stored in that office. Right, Attorney Fallon, that's all. For dear examination by the court. Mr. Moore, do you recall getting the letter from the court a month or so ago notifying you about your service in this trial and asking you not to talk to anybody about it or watch any more news media coverage? Yes, I do. The letter? Yes. Do you know if, did this discussion with your wife, do you know if it happened before or after you got the letter? I really can't say for sure. Have you had any other discussions about this case with your wife other than on that one occasion? No. And this question you may have asked already, but just to clarify, did you, other than remembering your wife's statement that she didn't have access to this file, was there any other discussion you had with her about this case and the evidence in the clerk's office? No, nope. the court. All right, the clerk will escort you from the courtroom at this time, wherein the juror was excused. The court, any further brief argument from either party? Attorney Fallon, quite frankly, I think the responses helped the state both on this argument and in with respect to the potential evidence of this case. I think the information obtained, possessed by Mr. Moore, is very helpful to the state, and it would be great to have him on the jury, quite frankly. But I don't want to take a chance that this conviction is reversed as a result of information that he has that no other juror may have. And can you just possibly imagine the discussion? Let's just say, for instance, the vial of blood was a central aspect of the case. 
because we still don't know if it is. But let's assume that it is. And let's assume there was a question about who had access or who would have known where it was. Can you imagine the discussion? I mean, after the arguments of counsel <clears throat> and Mr. Moore were to say, well, geez, my wife works there and she didn't even know where it was. How can we expect one of these officers to perhaps have snuck in there and gotten it? I mean, it's powerful, great stuff, helps us. But I don't want to take a chance of this conviction being reversed because of a juror has knowledge of the internal workings of the viable possibilities or impossibilities of access to that office. And as further evidence, he can't separate right now whether it's in a secure or unsecure area and he doesn't even know if he got that from his wife or the media. In fairness, this person should not sit as a juror. The court. Mr. Strang? Attorney Strang. I disagree. I mean, there's no risk of the conviction being reversed on this. We're the ones who are opposing the motion to strike him for cause. And by the time, just if the court's rulings remain as they are and are not reconsidered in any way, the jury will end the jury in the end will know a lot more from the evidence about where this file was, who may have had access to it, than Mr. Moore presently knows from the TV, and that what he knows from the television or the media sounds to me like more than he knows from Mrs. Moore, the court. All right, the court's impression from Mr. Moore when he came back in is that he does not remember. Well, he doesn't remember much detail about what, what he was told. He doesn't really remember whether the information he does have limited, as it may be, came from his wife or from the news media. I, I, don't, I don't believe he claims or would claim to possess any specific enough information that would impact this case one way or another. He only had one discussion with his wife, and it appears to relate to just her feelings, whether she had access to the evidence. And it does not appear to have been in great detail nor do I believe that it happened after the court's letter went out. It appears to because it doesn't mention any testing of the blood, but rather the existence of the blood evidence. I believe that relates back to the December hearing over in Chilton. So I'm gonna accept Mr. Moore as a juror in this case.